Jesus said, Kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took twice the oil of their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a shout, Look, here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No, there will not be enough for you or for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the other bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. The quote from our passage in Joshua today that says, As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord, is a popular one. I've seen it on all kinds of different artwork that's meant to hang in homes. And it's an important declaration to make. It's a statement of ultimate allegiance to God. But today we get to see the context in which that declaration is made and to ask whether we would truly make the same declaration today. My hope is that the answer is yes, but it's not as simple as a pretty saying hanging on a wall. It never is. What does it mean to say that we follow God, to say that our allegiance to God comes before anything else? And can we even say that honestly? These are the questions that Joshua is asking the Israelites in our passage today. And although the context is dramatically different, they are questions that still remain relevant for us thousands of years later. Joshua begins his talk by reminding the people that God made a covenant with them long ago, a covenant made with and carried out by their ancestors. A covenant by its very nature, is an agreement between two parties. Both parties are expected to honor and fulfill certain obligations and to hold one another accountable if need be. Unlike a contract, which is for a very specific project, a covenant is meant to be long-standing. The covenant that God made with the Israelite people is meant to extend for all time from generation to generation. But by the time that the book of Joshua was finished, the Israelites had already broken their covenant, and as a result, they had been run out of the promised land by the Babylonians. Although the book of Joshua looks back to a time of prosperity and conquest for the Jewish people, its original audience would have heard those stories while living in a foreign land amongst people who worship foreign gods. Joshua's injunction to make a choice, either worship the Lord or worship these foreign gods, 
would have rung true for them as well. Today, we don't think very much about foreign gods. It's just not something that we hear talked about. But I think that it is something with which we're all very familiar. Our gods, per se, don't usually come in the form of deities today. They come in the form of ideologies, wealth, power, violence, oppression, fame, prestige, anything that we place as a higher priority than our relationship with God, big G, God, we have turned into little gods. We are surrounded by messages that tell us that what we have or do or how we live isn't good enough. You can always have more, do more, be more than you are. Sometimes I wonder just what has happened to our culture if we allow these messages to flourish, if we believe these messages of fear and scarcity that we're fed day in and day out. And then I look at what's going on in our world right now, and it makes a little bit more sense. When people don't feel safe anymore, they go into survival mode. And survival mode involves hunkering down, protecting what's mine, and opposing anyone or anything that is different. It also involves telling ourselves false stories that if I just have this thing or I do this, then I will be safe and not fall victim to the chaos around us. But this is a cyclical pattern. Fear induces violence, which induces more fear, which induces more violence, over and over again, usually with escalating severity. Friends, our world and our country are deeply hurting right now. We are living in fear. When mass shootings become the norm, when we can't go to school or to a concert or a nightclub or go shopping or go to a movie or even come to church without worrying about being victims of a mentally unstable person with an assault rifle, what has happened to our country? The events of last Sunday were horrifying and tragic and they hit close to home for all of the obvious reasons. But in the aftermath of, yet again, talking about the need for stricter gun laws and about mental health crisis that we're currently facing, I found myself wondering, yet again, what it means to call myself a Christian today. I found Joshua's talk with the Israelites incredibly relevant. If I claim that my ultimate allegiance is to God through Jesus Christ, then that should inform every part of my life. It should inform how I think about current issues, how I live my life and make decisions, how I treat others, and how I engage in the world around me. In the aftermath of the horrific shootings in the church in Texas last Sunday, I could feel the fear and anxiety and frustration, the disillusionment and anger rising within myself, and I saw it rising within our country also. I found myself, yet again, asking myself which direction I would go. Would I give in to the negativity and fear? Or would I try to find another way, a more peaceful and love-centered way? And what would that look like? What does it mean for clergy to pastor churches at a time when people target churches for mass murder? What happens when we realize that on some level, this has always been the case. Houses of worship, whether they are mosques or temples or synagogues or churches, have frequently been the target of bombings and shootings, 
both here in the U.S. and worldwide. Knowing that, and yet having last Sunday's specific horrific event in mind, would I take Jesus' teachings about nonviolence and love of neighbor seriously? Or would I say, that all sounds good, Jesus, but that was then, and this is now. Joshua's injunction to choose this day whom you will serve is just as relevant for us today as it was for the Israelites thousands of years ago. I read a quote this week, something that popped up on my Facebook page, that said, everyone thinks Jesus is great until they get to the place where he says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. As I've been wrestling with how to understand what happened at that Texas church last Sunday and realizing that I'll never understand it, I've kept coming back to this quote in this verse. Joshua tells us that we must choose whom we will serve, and I agree with him. And if I claim to choose Christ, which I do, then I follow someone whose teachings conflicted with his own culture as much as they conflict with ours today. I choose to follow someone who was killed for putting his own allegiance with God rather than with the leaders and cultural norms of the day. I choose to follow someone who prayed for, from the cross for the very people who put him there. Choosing to follow God and to follow Christ never has and never will be the easy way. Joshua warns the Israelites of this, and Jesus warned his followers of the same thing. Following God and Christ will always mean clashing with our culture to some degree. It will mean challenging ourselves to prayerfully reflect on how to respond to the evil around us, rather than allowing our knee-jerk, fear-based reactions to rule our behavior. Violence begets violence, which begets violence. The only way to stop the cycle is love. Love of neighbor, love of enemy, and love of God. But just proclaiming that love isn't enough. We have to show it through our actions. None of us can go back and undo the evil that has been done in all the mass shootings that our country has suffered over the last few years. I wish that we could, but we can't. Our role today is to choose how we move forward as individuals, as families, as Americans, and as Christians. Our role is to allow our faith to govern every aspect of our lives, including how we vote, how we move through the world, and how we respond to what goes on around us. This is not easy, but it is the only way if we are to honestly claim that as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord.